very, well, it's 14th to 17th century, um, yeah, Duomo, and the square is probably 18th and 19th century, but very nice. Are we live now or not? Yes. Can we start? Ma'am, you may start. Okay. Good evening and a warm welcome to KNMA Conversations. Though we miss meeting you on meeting you in KNMA galleries surrounded by artworks and all audiences warming up for the talks and conversations with hot cups of chai and coffee, we are glad that digital technology has made it possible to remain connected and reach out to a global audience. The KNMA is deeply honored today to have one of the most prominent artists of our times, British sculptor Sir Anthony Gormley, join us this evening from London. Anthony Gormley needs no introduction, and honestly, no introduction or extent of words can sum up the breadth of his practice, his remarkable pursuit, passion, and commitment to art and his art making. He continues to reflect each day of his life on what art means, what can it be, and what it can do for us. Anthony's prolific 40 years of practice, his exhaustive website comprising of 220 solo shows to date across the world, in fascinating urbanscapes and remotest sites, makes him a significant voice and an influential figure to subsequent artist generations in various parts of the world, including India. He has won several prestigious prizes and awards and was knighted in 2014. In my few conversations with him, I've been amazed at his articulation of complex ideas in simple words and phrases. I'm privileged in welcoming you, Sir Anthony Gomley, and being in conversation with you, and along with Tushar and audience, learn more about you and your practice. To me, you are the quintessential Shilpin. I use this expression from traditional Indian aesthetics, not calling you a Rupakar or a Kalakar, simply a sculptor, but a Shilpin, with a metaphysical and spiritual connotation to the term that somehow has gotten obscured in modern and contemporary times, but best suited to introduce the genius of this extraordinary artist. Just as Shilpi is not just a sculptor or a craftsman, but or an ordained disciple of Pancharatra Agama, that is the one who practices the doctrine of five elements that vary from fire and air to water, earth, and space. Gormley explores the secrets of the cosmos through the spiritual dimensions of the human sensorium. Inspired by advances in physics and science and nourished by the Eastern mystical traditions, particularly after his visit and stay in India when he was starting out. Anthony's widely acclaimed sculptural installations and public artworks venture into the infinite and the infinitesimal. For him, art is a space for reflection and space of art is a place for embodying and experiencing what it means to be alive. I also welcome Tushar Jivrajka, founder and director of World Art Projects, who, who has known Anthony Gomley for several years now. Formerly, he ran the World Gallery in Mumbai, which was founded in 2009 as a physical space but he has now taken on a, now it has taken on a new form in focusing on few art projects every year. Tushar has been instrumental in bringing artworks by William Kentridge, 
Vim Delvoy and Clemente to India, while representing artists Nalini Malani, Shiba Chachi, and Ranveer Kalika from within India. Thank you, Tushar, for being with us today. <clears throat> I think, Tushar, you can say what you want to say, and then I welcomed you, I welcome Anthony, and Kiran is here with us, and maybe you can say a few words and we can hand over uh, to Anthony, people are really anxious and waiting to listen to him, looking forward and excited uh, to listen to his views. Yeah, Tushar. Thank, thank you, Rubina. I'm, I'm really excited to be here today and to help facilitate this conversation and to act as a bridge between Anthony and India. Um, I'd like to speak of my personal experience uh, with Anthony. Yeah, even before I became a gallerist uh, and I started working with artists, I had a strong passion to look at art wherever I was in the world. A large portion of my time went and still goes in looking at exhibitions. I see hundreds of thousands of artworks every year. And to be very frank, in my own personal opinion, I find most of it not so great. Some of it mediocre and some parts good. But just once in a while, very rarely, maybe once in a year or once in two years, I'll encounter something which stops me in my tracks. I'm at a loss of words and I feel a wave of emotions surging through my body. I'm in an uncomfortable but utterly delightful state. And when it's over, I'm not the same anymore. My being and my mind has expanded. I never forget those first encounters. That to me is the true role of art, to change the way we look at the world and to experience it in a different way. One such moment happened to me in London at the Hayward Gallery in 2007. I walked into a room which was filled with mist and white light. Everything was white. There were others in the room and I could hear them, but I could not see them. I could barely see my own hands. I disappeared. At the same time, I merged and became one with everyone. I get goosebumps even now when I say this, but it remains one of the most powerful moments I've ever experienced in this lifetime. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, I had a real life experience of non-duality, of Advaita, of God, of Samadhi. Being an avid reader of Eastern philosophy and having been a meditator for a long time, I had an intellectual understanding of these words, but for me to physically experience it, where it all suddenly came alive within my being was an incredible and unforgettable moment. This work was a work called Blinding Light by Anthony Gormley. To me, having that kind of a visceral response from an artwork is a sign from above. I must somehow get to know and work with this artist. I must manifest this project of theirs. Um, the experience that I have had with this work, I want to share with my part of the world, which doesn't have access uh, to these kind of artworks. And whenever I have any of these crazy ideas and mad ambitious projects, I can confidently say that there's no one who has been a better champion, supporter, and patron of these projects than Kiran Nadar, Rubina Karode, and the KNMA. Kiran and Rubina have dedicated their lives to providing the Indian art world with a platform that no one before has even come close to providing. Rubina, as the chief curator and director of the KNMA, has provided us with some of the best exhibitions that the Indian art world has seen. Nalini Malani's three-part retrospective, Nasreen Mohammadi, Vivan Sundaram, etc. While Rubina's exhibitions are scholarly and encyclopedic, they're never inaccessible to even the most non-art audiences. Besides this, she has also been a true supporter and patron of the arts. It is not an exaggeration to say that the extensive support received by Indian gallerists 
and artists by the KNMA is unparalleled in our country's art history. So when the opportunity to bring Anthony's work to India came up, the first door I went knocking on was that of KNMA. And Rubina was as excited as I was. I think a big part of what we do at Volt Art Projects is to bring the best artists in the world to this region. And I think bringing large ambitious art shows from the best artists working in the world today is critical for the Indian art audience as well as for Indian artists who cannot afford to travel abroad to look at shows. I'm really glad that Rubina, Kiran, and the KNMA have been pioneering in that regard. And I'm really excited to see what unfolds with everything that's coming up with the new museum. So with that, I hand it over to you, Anthony and Rubina. Thanks. Anthony. To you, straight away. Oh, um, thank you both um, for your welcome and that very moving account of your experience of blind light, uh, Tushar. Thank you, uh, Kiran and Rubina, for, for inviting me to, uh, to be part of this conversation today. Um, this, is a, this is a very strange return for me. I left India in 1974, a long time ago, uh, and never imagined that um, my reconnection would, would end up being in cyberspace, but uh, so it is, and I'm thankful for it. I think we all are, that these methods of uh, sharing, sharing time and mind uh, are possible. So, um, Rubina, ask me anything you like. <laughs> yeah, can we start the... Um... Can you share the slides, Priya? Can you go to the first one or is it not there? Is this the first one? Yeah, this is the first one. I, I took the one of me lying on my back because I thought it wasn't a good image of, uh, of the life of an artist. <laughs> That's true, but I liked it for various reasons. I would start by saying I liked it because it, uh, it said a lot. It spoke about uh, the challenges that you pose to viewers, the, the viewers and their vantage points, the way they look and experience art, uh, equally challenging for institutions to, to display your work, which are often far from being state forward. They are disorienting, eccentric, subverting fixed notions of inhabiting. Uh, spaces and demanding active participation and effort. So viewers have to navigate around them, move through dark interiors, sometimes through blinding light as well. And therefore that, uh, that image was important for me because you were lying I'm down. I'm really sorry, Rubida. I feel... <laughs> but, <okay. laughs> but, but I have summed it up because you were lying on the ground and you were looking at your own work, which was overbearing. I think it was very overwhelming. Uh, was a very interesting image to start with. Nevertheless, I think uh, we just start straight away from here and um, you can uh, talk about this work and you can tell us what happened when you came to India first, when you were young and in your twenties, I think, and, yeah. and stayed in Calcutta, isn't it, for two yeah. years? No, I, yeah, I was, I was 21 and uh, yeah, I had, I had finished uh, doing a, a, a degree at university. I didn't, uh, I don't think I, I, I knew what, what, what direction my life was going to take. I just knew that I didn't want uh, a boring job uh, and I didn't want to, I, I'd done uh, anthropology, archeology span and art history. And uh, all of my colleagues were rushing off to either join Sotheby's or get a job in a museum. And um, I'd been, I'd been uh, to India in 1969 uh, and I thought that's where I should go. Uh, it took me a year to get there, but th this is a work that I made on returning uh, to England uh, at the end of 1974. I'd been away for three years. And I think it, it was, for me, this articulation, this is a friend of mine, uh, Nikki Chubb, who I just got to lie on the studio floor and it was, uh, I mean, it's an image that is very familiar, I think, to anyone that's been to India. Um, but 
this this idea of in a way the personal in collective space um, haunted me, uh, and you know I, I I'd had uh, I, I I won't say stolen, but anyway I'd lost all my money um, in Calcutta and had had lived on the streets, just uh, finding the company of of uh, my fellow. Um, yeah, street dwellers, uh, incredibly uh, warm and, uh, yeah, welcoming, extraordinary. But the, the image of, of uh, sleepers on the railway station at Howrah or, or, yeah, in, in the streets anywhere uh, in India remained with me as this powerful... Um, yeah, image, a haunting image of, in a, in a sense, um, human vulnerability, uh, but also tenderness. Uh, the, the, the way that, that you might find these forms, white dotis covering bodies, maybe with two slippers and a, and a transistor radio next to them. Um, <laughs> In a very busy street with with uh, bullet carts and and cycle rickshaws and rickshaws and trucks, uh, and this statement about stillness, about uh, in a, in a way the need for shelter, uh, the need for in a way an internal life, stated so so powerfully in as it were the public realm, you could say this was the seed of everything that happened since and uh, sadly this work is, I mean it, what it, I call it a work I mean it's just an old hospital sheet we don't have so many dotis in, in, in England it's an old hospital sheet just dipped in plaster very... and allowed to, to, to go yes. solid on the body of a friend and it interestingly the body and the clothing has become one unit and sometimes when we see these images uh, we get a sense as if it's a tent, you know, it's just, it just is a shelter. It's a tent. It just takes on that form, you know, with body completely hidden inside and protected inside. Next, please. Priya, next, please. Um, okay, so tell us about this one, because these are your works in the 70s. Yeah, this this is sort of it's interesting because I went to our, you know having been to university and done a lot of academic stuff, uh, all of which I loved, but but in a way was not about uh, engaging with stuff. Um, I I then went to art school and did a lot of terrible work because um, I was trying everything and and was very uh, kind of influenced, particularly by the work of Martin Naylor, who was a uh, Kind of fascinating narrative sculptor, um, obsessed maybe with 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 cinema and music and poetry. But anyway, I I I made this work um, while in a postgraduate degree at the Slade, and I was simply just trying to deal with what is the story in material itself. Does matter have something inherent in it that has something to tell us? So this is a rearranged tree. This is a 30-year-old uh, larch tree, the main trunk of the tree, uh, made into 30 piles of one to 30 pieces that in a way talks about time in matter, time in material. And the next slide, can we have the next slide? Um, this was a, the, the same idea of taking a, a uh, yeah, 30 foot high um, larch tree and cutting it into about 2008 millimeter slices and lay, laying it out in the floor on the floor. And um, yeah, for me, this is just called flat tree. And uh, the, this, this idea of somehow now a very optical vortex that mm. reveals in, in a sense, the annular rings that were stacked in the previous work, but allows us to think about time and place through the agency of this, in a way, the history of the generation of the material itself. It's very interesting. I'm keen to ask you, did you ever carve? 
when you began your career, when you began your yeah uh, i mean i did everything i did i did the, the, the modeling the carving and the construction the three kind of uh, you know and i wanted to do everything when i arrived i was i came back from india having done two years of very kind of you know consistent meditation and it was like i was reconnecting with with the our, you know the ability to 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 be in the body and and be be part of a kind of transformation so i was yeah very uh, i tried carving i did uh, yeah stone carving wood carving modeling bronze casting i had to go at absolutely everything and then i got very involved with fiberglass i mean i was just i i just wanted to dive into in a way material i can remember that first year at i started at the central st martins um and uh yeah just wanted to 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 kind of try everything i was working with fire working with water working with clay working with earth i went out uh seeking kind of materials um in in the river thames in in gardens in street dustbins um but uh yeah the your your sculptures are already off pedestals your your you're creating these works right on the ground as i can see i mean all the slides that we saw till now three or four um uh, the pedestal is no more there and uh, uh you're going straight to exploring the material so let's go to the next slide and see what you're doing next um it's yeah. uh yeah i i guess i i had i had just been uh, i mean i i did this yeah very romantic very narrative work at that goldsmith i i left the i left st martins went to goldsmith for the final two years of my ba uh and then i wanted just to yes kind of just quieten down what is stuff what is uh what 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 is just immediately around me so this this work which i i think is equal in a way to the sleeping place the first slide but now translated through an understanding in a way about the history of contemporary uh, art practice and in a way its potential so this is a set of my clothes the last clothes that my parents uh, bought for me cut into 8 mm strips that are continuous and and kind of just knotted together so you start at the bottom with a very nice pair of church brothers shoes that i inherited from my father and then through a a kind of gray woolen socks and then up through uh trousers and uh and, and underpants through uh shirt uh, under vest uh yeah pull over and jacket it stops at the neck but it's expanded these these clothes have been expanded to the size of the room this is about 6 18 foot so it's an 18 foot square that actually divided the room more or less in half and on the floor you can just see the layers of leather that were underneath uh my feet uh between my feet and the and the floor and what is this it's called room but i'm just saying you know i'm making i'm making a kind of equation between the space of the self or the the space of the individual and in a way the collective spaces of 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 the built environment of our of our architecture and making this arena mm. and and maybe saying you know that the space of the self is not so exclusive that maybe it is a porous space i mean i i i'm saying this now after i met i after i made it when i made it i was just really intrigued with this idea that you could as it were occupy space uh without colonizing it without commanding it that it could still be porous it could still be open and that you set up in a sense a kind of psychological uh confrontation but also invitation so this is an arena you could say you make the the condition of the individual um you know you could say the condition of the given identity inherited from parent social status etc cetera, etc cetera. and then you open it into another kind of enclosure 
but that it becomes open to interpretation and in, invites the viewer to somehow be inside that arena because you, you can't go into it, but you can stand and look at this space that is offered to you, not to enter physically, but to imaginatively inhabit. Okay, that's interesting. Next, please, Priya. So, yes. having, having kind of, I, I, this is all going to sound, I'm, I, you can interrupt me, Rabina, because this, you know, uh, th this is 40 years after the event, and it all sounds like I knew what I was doing. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just trying, I was trying to re-found what, uh, what, in a way, sculpture as a form of material thinking Mm. material feeling could be so anyway if if this if 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 one one aspect of the human condition is is in in a way the identity of of your of your um skin or the thing that in, that immediately encloses you another part is is what you eat and i love the you know i love the the division between agni and soma in the rig veda for example the the the, the all phenomena are, this is a dialogue between the eater, eater and the eaten. Anyway, the, the idea that, that, that sculpture uh, traditionally is seen as a way of imposing uh, mind onto matter, imposing concepts, visions of beauty onto raw material. Mm -hmm. I just felt, you know, and you could say, I'm talking now, it's from this 40 year distance with, with kind of hindsight, but I had an intuition that surely there is a, the, the potential, sculptural potential of transformation is inherent in each and every one of our lives. And we, we, we transform matter into mind, in other words, the reverse process daily. And uh, anyway, I, I had been, I, I decided I wanted to use bread because this was the staff of life. This was, this was a, a common material. And I'd been making, in a way, collages. I've got one just here. I've still got the one that I made in my bedroom, which was just cutting slices of, of, uh, of Mother's Pride. It's called Mother's Pride there. Isn't that amazing? That this was the most uh, commonly found steam-baked, industrialized bread. And it's called Mother's Pride, which is a what? paradox and a, and, a, and a story all on its own. But anyway, I... I had been making these collages, making in a way B, you know, this ancient Taoist symbol of a, of a circle with a hole in the middle mm. out of bits of bread of various ages and moldiness. And then I suddenly realized, why am I, why am I just making in a way aesthetic object of this everyday material? Why aren't I relating with the material just like everybody relates to it? Why aren't I eating it? So then I set up this crazy project over three months that I was going to eat the equivalent of my own volume out of as much Mother's <laughs> Pride as I needed to, to do the job, which happened to be 600 loaves. So each slice is eight millimeters thick. You have 23 slices in the average loaf. Um, I needed 600 loaves. I, I made a drawing. I, I, I lay on the ground, my wife, drew around me. I used this silhouette as, a, as the basis for, for a contour map. I then had the drawing on the wall and I knew I have to, I have to eat two-thirds of the first, third slice down and five slices across. <laughs> and every day uh, had my regime. I will never eat this bread again. Uh, but uh, I... <laughs> I I consumed, uh, I, I decided it was very important for both conceptual, uh, conceptually, philosophically, but also in a way morally, that this was really the result of a transformation of matter into energy. Anyway, I won't say mind because my mind is limited. Um, but anyway, uh, this is the work. And, 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 uh, and I showed this uh, in my first exhibition. Uh, what year was this, Anthony? I made it in 1980, and the uh, yeah, the piece was shown uh, at the Whitechapel in 1981. <laughs> Here comes my wife. 
But um, this is Rubina. Hello. And, uh, and uh, she's bringing me food now. Look, I've got I've got a whole I've got a whole thing of uh, spaghetti, but I won't eat that. <laughs> <laughs> So, but it must have been interesting to see the response in 1981 and now when you um, showed it again, I think, at the Royal Academy. Was this work shown? No, no, no. Oh, it's no, no. now in the collection of the Tate and uh, oh, it's, yes, uh, the tape, yes. it's quite a... Uh, no, it's funny. There, there's a funny story to this because um, this was in my first exhibition and it was the first work I was so excited, the first work ever to be acquired by a museum. Uh, it was, uh, uh, yeah, bought by by uh, Alan Bowness for the for the Tate, or that's where he wanted to present. It went to the Tate. It went to be shown. It, at the same time, it had to be inspected by the trustees, and there was a beautiful Howard Hodgkin, a beautiful uh, Patrick Caulfield on the walls. And uh, somebody said, well, look, there, there's something moving on the surface of this Howard Hodgkin. I can see it's a little, uh, uh, anyway, uh, this thing had become totally infested with a, a little creature called the Indian bookworm. Um, and uh, anyway, it was chaos. So they had to isolate this room, fumigate it. Uh, that was the end of this work. Now this work is in the collection, but it's in a glass box to protect us against the chemicals that have been put. Anyway, there's another whole story, but it's, it's just quite funny. Um, uh, anyway, this is another, I think, step on my evolution. Next, please, Bia. Yeah. So this, uh, this is another work that ended up, uh, yeah, when, when, when they couldn't have the, the bed, they said, well, what else can we have? I said, well, the only other important work from this period that was also in my Whitechapel show is, is natural selection. And I, I do think of this as a, another kind of key work in the evolution of the thinking and feeling. So this is 24 objects, um, 12 natural, 12 man-made, that form a kind of morphological progression. They are all there, enclosed in a new uh, clothing, a, 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 a carapace, a skin of lead. And they move from a point, which is a P, to a pencil, to a courgette, to a, a, a point chisel, to a banana, to a vibrator, to a bradawl, to a, anyway. And so you go through this uh, point line morphological progression uh, getting more and more, uh, in a way, fruit-like, to the point where you have a, a dialogue in the middle, the 12th and the 13th, or no, the 11th and the 12th object are a, a goose egg and a grenade that are almost identical in shape, but have very obvious, uh, completely diverse uh, uh, associations. This, this was a time where, in a way, there is a very deep dialogue with Duchamp uh, mm -hmm. throughout my work. You could say I, I ended up taking the idea of the found object and, and, and saying I'm taking my own body and my own existence as my found object. But in this, in this, in this work, I'm really, I'm really trying to deal with, a, with a, another idea about, about time that you could say was there in the rearranged tree, but, and, and putting human culture and our potential for manipulation in the frame of, you could say, uh, evolution as a, as a whole, and, and using this, this association with, with, with Darwin's uh, yeah, um, yeah, origin of species and, and, the, and natural selection as its, as its uh, kind of conceptual uh, framework. And people, um, are they supposed to touch it or, or no? Uh, well, I mean, it's interesting, you see, you see it here. I, you know, you, you're, you're very uh, quick uh, and right to point out this thing of how important the floor is to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I have always wanted in, in a sense, 
the work to share a common ground with the viewer. Mm -hmm. And uh, this whole thing of what, it, what, what is tactile, what, what, what is in invitation to touch and what, and I think it's very important to me, that, you know, this is a toxic material, this is lead. We, 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 we're actually, we have to tell the guards when this is shown like this, uh, that they, they, they actually shouldn't touch, but they should walk. They should walk the line. They should, the, the, in order to understand the work, you have to move through space. And this is something that has remained as a very, very important, in a way, precondition of the engagement with the work. Right. You, share, you share the space with this work. The, the, the space should be uh, clean. It should be, you know, it should, it should in, in, a, in a sense, be open, but uh, waiting. So, so uh, have this sense of uh, alertness. Uh, and, and then you step into a space where, in a sense, there is a choreography determined by the viewer, the work, and the, the enclosure of the, of, of the room. And uh, yeah, I, I guess, you know, at, uh, at the Royal Academy, even though there was a low plinth, the work gets squashed, and that's the, the, the risk you take. Did Date acquire this work? Uh, yes, they did, yeah. Yeah, they have this too. Yeah. Next, Priya. I'm sorry. I'm I'm not wanting to show you know all the great works of mine that happen no, to be. No, I think. Uh, <laughs> but but um, it's the the so, evolution. Yeah. So this. Um, it's also being conveyed. Sorry, say that again. Yes, I'm saying. Of, you know, your voice is breaking up. These ideas. Oh, dear. Is the that way you spoke you, about, you... Um, the Go way on. you spoke about common ground and the uh, space of anticipation and navigation, I think. Those were very interesting ideas that came through. Um, let us know about this now. These are huge spaces. No, I guess, I mean, this, we've now leapt uh, 15 years later or 14 years later. Yeah. Um, this is critical mass. Yes. Um, I, I guess right from the time that I studied physical anthropology, I was very, very interested in, as it were, uh, understanding the lexicon of uh, yeah, body posture. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, 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 I was very interested in Elias Canetti, for example, in, in uh, Masum Macht, uh, Crowds and Power. He, he kind of uh, identifies, um, as it were, the inherent, the inherent uh, yeah, proposition, you could say, of any uh, body posture. And the, anyway, here are 12 basic body postures from the fetal, which you can see in the left-hand side of this slide, uh, the, the crouching figure that is uh, doing a shoulder stand. Um, they, they, it's interesting, it, it took 20 years for me to realize that this work could be shown uh, as a linear progression, uh, very like the work that I've just shown you, Natural Selection indicating the kind of the absolutely basic idea of the ascent of man. But at, I, I was absolutely insistent this should not be narrative and there shouldn't be any kind of clear, uh, yeah, kind of proposition in the work. So this is uh, 12 basic body positions from fetal to standing, from facing the ground to facing the sky made five times each and uh, in a way just tipped, uh, dropped off the back of a lorry. But, mm -hmm. but th this was made for this precise space. This is the Remisa in Vienna, uh, which is an old uh, yeah, lager for, for, for trams. Mm -hmm. I think there are, there are only maybe 17 works that were not in this pile 
And you can see on the left-hand side, there are two identical works that are what I would say a, a mourning figure, a figure uh, in, in loss, a position of loss or despair or uh, longing or, or sadness, uh, which is then reversed. In the left-hand side, you can see it's the same, exactly the same work turned the other way up. And it becomes a jongleur, it becomes the, you know, the, the, the acrobat, the, mm. the, the one that can balance a, a ball on its feet. Mm. So I, I, I guess I'm both uh, alluding to the, the, the potential of the, the viewer to, to ascribe uh, a whole range of totally different uh, emotional kind of uh, uh, yeah, associations with any one work and saying, you know, this is free. So you can see the same work to the right uh, at the same level mm. in the image is lying on its back. Anyway, um, this, is the, this is the site, this is Central Europe. This is the site of, of the, the Jewish Holocaust. The iron rail you cannot see without being aware of the the iron rails that led to Buchenwald, to Auschwitz, to Birkenau. The, uh, I, I, I guess I wanted to think again, make a, a question about human nature and human identity in the light of history and in the light particularly of 20th century history. And I'm so, asking, in, do you know the year, this, year of this work? 95. 95. Uh, in the middle of these, in in the middle of these uh, iron railway lines, I cut uh, uh, fourteen pits that I thought of uh, as stations. Mm. They are graves. Uh, you can see mm. a seated figure half sitting in the grave uh, before the threshold that leads to the uh, other end of the building. This building is two hundred meters long. Um, again, you are invited to walk, and there is nothing told. These are remnants. These are industrial fossils that have just been, as it were, abandoned. And it, the, the viewer is put in the position of being the re reconciler of, is a way, this material evidence, this material forensic evidence, mm -hmm. the, the existing space which has its own history, and the references that they might or might make, might not make with their own lives. And um, this work I continue to show. I've, I have kept it um, because I think in, a, in another way, this is my mature work. This is the, the period after making, uh, for, for the 15 years prior to this, I had simply been making boxes, literally cases, body cases that presented the space that a human body had once occupied, but anybody could now imaginatively occupy, and substituted And are these the, your body? Yeah, yeah, they're all made from, from me. I, I decided at a certain point that I had to use my own body. I didn't want to, as it were, force or use the actions mind body and feeling of others, I had to, uh, I mean, I think this is the truth came. If we go to the next slide, maybe, maybe the next slide will show the methodologies. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is a typical moment in those years between 1981 and 1995. I, I would have to be entirely still and around me, the, 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 the hand on the right is Vickens' hand, my wife, we just walked in now. The hands on the right are uh, Jonathan Lake in Hall, my assistant at the time. I would simply uh, uh, take a position and, and uh, stay there until uh, the plaster had gone completely hard and I was then uh, cut out uh, of this. I mean, it's an interesting philosophical proposition, this process, because this is about giving up all agency. This is about, in a way, becoming an object uh, and 
being this still silent thing around which other people move. And I think that 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 vision is actually mm. something that has r r relative kind of, uh, yeah, connection with how I want, in, in a sense, I'm imagining viewers have to relate to the work. But anyway, the, the, th this was the way that all of those um, critical mass works were, were made, and they were cast from the outside of a mold. But the, they were the first works that went from these hollow, lead-covered, uh, insulated, hermetic uh, body spaces to masses, to masses that are eight to ten times uh, the specific gravity of a, of, of a living body, my body that gave them form. And uh, some of the postures are quite uh, uh, challenging. I mean, they, you're compressed, you're stifled, you're crouching, you're completely tightly become a bundle and you're almost suffocating. Am I right? Yes. I, um, yeah, they, they, were, they were real adventures <laughs> to me. <laughs> and I think I, I, I mean, I, I've tried recently to, to go back to this and it is, I, I, I'm a bit surprised myself that I could do, I mean, particularly that fetal one. Yes. Uh, the, you know, it, it is, it, it's an hour or two hours of uh, complete and utter stasis. And uh, yeah. Um, and meditation. I, I don't want to make meditation. heroic uh, claim on this, but but I I'm, I I I'm, I managed to do it, and I think I couldn't have done it <laughs> if I hadn't done vipassana meditation. In fact, because I think that was that that was my training in mm -hmm. terms of being still. Next, please. Amazing. Oh, yes. So, yeah, this is going back now to, well, I mean, not so far because this was made pretty, this, you could say there's a dialogue here. Uh, this is called learning to think. Um, there's a dialogue here between learning to think and critical mass, uh, this, this mm -hmm. hinge moment between uh, the void body cases and the massive body forms. Mm -hmm. um, this was a, a wonderful, uh, you know, occasionally you get offered uh, a context that you feel you can't refuse. Everybody else had refused this. This was, this was the, the city jail in Charleston, uh, South Carolina, site of uh, you know, the, the American War of Independence, um, site of massive social injustice. This was a, this was a, you know, a core uh, slavery um, plantation location. And uh, nobody wanted to touch this prison. Uh, mm. I said, please give it to me. This is the most uh, re re resonant uh, location for uh, a work of contemporary art. Uh, but I, I, you, have to, you have to agree to me removing all of the glass from all of the windows. Uh, and they did, which was good. So um, this is a... This is one of the collective prison rooms uh, on the first floor. The, the windows have all been removed, but the bars are still there. Mm -hmm. So you're aware of this uh, kind of damp tropical atmosphere outside. You can hear the birds. Uh, you, you're aware of sunlight passing into the room. Uh, and uh, yeah, I made this work specifically for this installation, for this piece. Uh, I wanted it to refer to the lynchings that we know were common practice uh, uh, um, yeah, in, in the 18th, 19th, and even in, uh, to our shame, uh, the 20th century. I find but, it, yeah, go ahead. Um, yes. but, but at the same time, I wanted there to be yeah, I mean, I was brought up a Catholic, so there's still, in a way, shades of the redemptive in my work. So here, having established, in a way, the ground as the, as the ground base of common experience, and in a way, the, the ground as the necessary thing on which art and life should rest. 
Mm. I'm now suggesting that the, the, here they, they share this common, invisible common ground, but more importantly, mm. a zone that is beyond the visible, that is, as it were, the, the arena of imagination or mental connection. So it's a, I mean, I, I wanted there to be a very strong physical kind of experience here. You come in through this iron door with its two eye holes, um, and there you are sharing the space with these present absences that yeah, I are seemingly connected to mm -hmm. another space that is inaccessible. Mm. And uh, yeah, they're all identical. Uh, they are uh, seemingly not in pain. They are calmly accepting their position and their valency and their uh, looking out. That was also very important. They, even though we're in this prison, here are these, these in a way, vessels uh, that are, by implication, looking beyond the con context of, of, of this prison. Yeah, but it, it still is very compelling. It looks bare and brutal. And at the same time, it tests the limits of uh, human endurance. Yeah, it's funny, you know, uh, I'm, I don't see this. It's interesting what you just said, and it may well be the result of the central point of view and the perspective and everything that we take this as a representation in a kind of uh, Renaissance way of, a, of an event. Um, and I, I, you know, in the same way, I mean, we're using, I'm using the same, this five times. The, the breaking of the erratic, the, the idea that we're not, you know, on one hand, I'm, I'm saying our artwork can no longer be the unique individual object that has massive aura that we have to, like, respect as a, as a unique thing. Here, here is, a, is a multiplicity, a kind of, uh, this, is, this is art made in the time of mechanical uh, reproduction. Um, and I don't, I don't think of this, but maybe it's the failure uh, that I don't see this as a picture. We are looking at it as a picture, but in fact, it's, it's, a, it's a site, it's a place, it's a place of both presence and absence. So you could say these humanly shaped darknesses that are, in a way, bits of light, uh, bits of night inserted into the day, mm. uh, are in a way just yeah catalysts for our own uh, in 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 a, in a sense again uh, kind of being there with them. The feet are at our eye level or they're at my eye level, uh, and they kind of um, well I I while referring to all of the horror of of of, of yeah hanging. Uh, they are also, I think, something else. So they are, in a, in a sense, a uh, bridge mm. to the suffering of the, of, of the body. For me. Yeah. Next, please. Oh, yes. So... We would love to know about this. It's... Uh... It's your very, yeah, very this, is, um, this is where this work has ended up, but it was originally made. Uh, you know, the, I, I have just, I mean, I feel somewhat embarrassed to be saying this uh, to an audience um, where these kinds of inv invitations perhaps don't exist. I mean, I've just shown you... Um, yeah, Two work, so both critical mass and and uh, learning to think were made were paid for by the agents that, that one was the uh, uh, Spoleto Festival, the other was just the, the city of Vienna, and here this work was paid for by the Schleswig Holstein Kunstverein. Uh, uh, I mean, unbelievable! This is a hundred, uh, 
yeah, iron castings placed on a on a floodplain originally in Cuxhaven, uh, the site of uh, mass emigration in in the time between the fall of the Weimar Republic and the rise of Nazism in Germany, and this was. Um, I guess the continuation in, of my thinking about, in a way, the public potential of sculpture in the 20th century, at the end of the 20th century. Um, you know, we, sculpture and art in general, you could say, uh, its relation to power, the degree to which art has, in a sense, been controlled and served uh, the patron, uh, I think, ha has meant that, that yeah, on the one hand, we have the, the, the kind of uh, the stereotype of most ideas of most people's ideas of sculpture is, oh, it's a statue, a statue of a beautiful naked woman or a powerful uh, man. And uh, anyway, I think that's confused uh, the issue of in a way, art's fundamental uh, nature as a conversation, a conversation with time, place, and life. And uh, I mean, I, I guess, yeah, for me, this work was just thinking uh, in the context of Cooks, Cookshaven and the mass emigration, particularly of, of European Jews uh, from Bremenhaven and Cookshaven, uh, to to America, a a continuation of an idea of the pioneer that was also you know in the mind of Adam Smith. I mean, in the mind of John Smith, in the in the in 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 the mind of all of those who set sail on the on on the Mayflower uh, two hundred uh, years ago. Um, no, four hundred. Sorry, four hundred years ago. Uh, 14, 14, 20. Um, they were looking for a new life on the other side of the horizon. Mm -hmm. That move westwards, you could say the move westwards that brought humankind from the Anatolian crescent, from, from the fertile crescent uh, up the Danube and uh, into Scandinavia, that, 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 that urge to continually find new land and find new hope. Um, I... I, I wanted to deal with. So here, um, this is now the work repositioned in, in outside Liverpool, mm -hmm. uh, which has its own histories of, of the transportation of bodies. Um, this was one of our uh, slaver ports. Um, many, many slaves thrown still alive as damaged cargo uh, from, the, from, from the bulwarks of, of slaving ships. Anyway, never mind about that. I think that rather like the Holocaust that, that lies at the back or, or lynchings that lies at the back of, of learning to think or, or um, critical mass, uh, I think there's a, bigger, there's a bigger subject here. So this is called Another Place. It deals with the idea that, that yeah, we have, we have limits, we have, a, we have a skin, we have a, a bounding condition, we, we cover it in clothes, we have... We have you know, we live in rooms, the rooms uh, aggregate into villages, into towns, into cities, but our final boundary is the horizon. The horizon is the perceptual limit, the perceptual skin of our sensorium. But we have, human beings have always imagined what lies on the other side of the horizon, this perceptual skin. And uh, Anyway, this, this is an open work that is just there. Uh, it's disintegrating in the elements. It's a, it's a work, you could say, of culture offered back to nature, um, but deals again with time, the subject that we dealt with in, the, in, in those uh, early tree works. It deals with appearance and disappearance. It deals with human fr fragility. Uh, it, it is the opposite, in a way, of the heroic, um, here are th these are 17 uh, body body casts taken at different times of breathing, either with total exhalation, total inhalation, and everything in between, all looking out at nine degrees uh, uh, north of due west, 
across uh, into the Atlantic. Um, they are, they cover about, there are a hundred works, they cover about uh, three kilometers uh, north to south and a kilometer deep uh, from the high tide line out to, to sea. Next, please. Is there another slide of this one? Yeah. Yeah, obviously they are subject to uh, all the conditions of the sea. Yes. And uh, at high tide, uh, there are maybe five works that you are, that are still visible uh, in the high tide line. Uh, the ones that are furthest out. This is a entirely flat plain, but it has been tipped to keep parallel with the with with the beach. Uh, so it means that at high tide, the furthest the furthest ones out are uh, yeah about eleven meters under the surface. It's interesting, you said once, and you said in some of your interviews that sculpture, not the roof. And I'm seeing uh, the outdoor makes it very uh, different, very atmospheric. And in fact, it changes with the time, isn't it? It changes what it might be looking in the morning or in the evening at sunset, or what it might look when the tide is there, or the tide is low or tide is high. This whole idea that you talked about appearing and disappearing also, uh, talking about living and dying in different ways. I think that idea, the evocation of that, um, it seems like an existential image. Yeah, it is. I think, it, I, I think that the, this desire of, I think us all in different ways, you know, some, some of us have children and some of us make sculpture, some of us make, make make breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, some of us, you know, uh, act on matter by brushing our teeth. Um, but I think we are all aware of, in a, in a sense, the, the, the limitations of biological time, yeah. uh, our, our, our mortality. And, and I think sculpture has, from its very beginnings, been an attempt to inscribe something about human thought and human feeling into sidereal time, into, in a way, planetary time, into geological time. And you could say, so these are bodies that are, yeah, eight to 10 times the specific gravity of a living body that are mineral. They are made of iron. What is iron? Iron is at the core of this planet. Iron in, 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 the, in the core is at such high pressure that it is solid. But in, you know, if you go down 2,000 uh, or 3,000 kilometers down, you will find exactly this material at exactly the same temperature that I made these forms at about 1,400 degrees. Iron is, a, is the thing that gives the, the the planet, it's mag magnetic field. It's the thing that keeps us on our trajectory uh, through space in the cosmos. It is the thing that, in a way, is the foundation. You know, if we think, if we think of, uh, yeah, we are all made from stardust. We are all aggregations of of this uh, infinite dance of matter, space, and time. I, I, I want these. You know, I want all of my work to be in. In a, in a sense, uh, yeah, a, a medium for a mindfulness of our position within, as it were, all of these scales of time, space, and uh, infinity, you could say. Um, and uh, it's important to me that art is open. And, and, and one of the great strengths of art that is, as it were, embedded in sidereal time, is that it doesn't need, it doesn't need a curator, it doesn't need a, a market, it doesn't need somebody, an apologia, it doesn't need, it doesn't need a building, it doesn't, it needs nothing. It can just be in the world and people can bump up against it and uh, do with it what they will, you know. So the dogs piss on them, the people dress them in their silly, uh, Christmas hats. The first time, uh, the first time I I went to see this work, were finished. It was just hilarious. 
because uh, about eight of the eight of them had like uh, yeah county ties of the sailing club of uh, of my you know old school tie. And then another five of them had condoms, and all the condoms were different colors. Anyway, I thought it was just brilliant. Um, I mean, you know, the people can get metaphysical, they can get meditative, they can get moody, but they can also play. Are they permanently installed? Yeah. Well, as permanent as anything okay. is. Uh, yeah, they they um, they were only supposed to be there for six months. So the the, the foundations of the work was uh, they were just uh, yeah nine foot long uh, tubes. Uh, they rusted eventually. So they they are permanent. We have we have fifty one now have proper uh, yeah foundations. Four are missing but we know where they are but they are nearly the deepest ones are nearly uh, four meters down because this is actually in a quicksand so it wasn't easy to put it in um, anyway we're hoping inshallah that uh, we can uh, yeah recover the four that have been temporarily uh, buried next please oh yes so um, yeah, this is your choice, Rubina, and I was glad you cho chose this because you know what do we do now? Uh, you know, I, I think I think that yeah, I, I get upset when my own work is you know being a kind of twenty first century sur surrogate uh, for mm -hmm. the for the nymph in the the nymph the nymph in the, in in the glade or the you know the the suit of armor on the stairs, or the or the you know the kind of proud trophy in your front room. Uh, how how do we recognize that the body itself can be a catalyst for experience? So so this this you know this this, um, this is called drawn, um, and it's basically if we have the next slide, you'll get the whole picture. It's basically eight uh, identical body forms that have been put. Priya, can you put the next slide on? Because it's the same work, yeah. So it's eight identical body forms that have just, as it were, been pushed into the, into the eight corners of our environment. We're the only animal that chooses to live uh, within a nest, within an within a intimate environment constructed on Euclidean principles. Anyway, what, what, I, what I really wanted this work to do was was talk about the relativity of, of spatial relations and our kind of our assumptions about flatness, about straightness, about up, down, which way is, is right. And I've, I've returned to this the whole time. But in a way, the viewer is put in, in the position of being in the center of the room. The viewer has to occupy the, 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 the you know, the Venus de Milo in the middle of the Louvre position and, and, and become aware of their relation to the ever-changing orientation and indeed um, mobility of our planet. You know, this planet is uh, rotating on its own axis at whatever it is, uh, 1,800 kilometers an hour. We are moving around the sun at a further very, very extreme rate. Uh, our, our galaxy is, is expanding. The whole of space is expanding at an extraordinary rate. The, the idea that anything is fixed is a delusion. Mm. So I, I wanted this work to in some way uh, kind of talk about all of those spinnings, all of those orbits, all of those uh, relative positions, all of that energy that is implicit uh, in, uh, in uh, you know, the, the material world that surrounds us. I mean, whether anybody would get that, you know, I've, I've given you a kind of pseudo-scientific uh, kind of apologia for, for, the, for the work. Um, you could just say, oh my God, you know, how does anybody, and it wasn't easy, uh, maintain a position like that? Because it, it was absolute agony. Getting your, 
getting your like yeah arms and shoulder blades flat against the wall while pushing your hands against it it was uh, no I, I again I, I i don't want to um kind of claim heroic feats um but it was interesting and and you can feel it in 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 your engagement with the work you also feel in a sense a kind of uh, yeah a mus a muscular tension a stretch and pull and the friction and tension and the viewer feels like i mean i i'm thinking if i enter it i would feel bracketed by them and it changes completely the relationship between your body space and architecture somehow you know so it's orienting it could be disorienting as well and and i think that is what you talked about the not getting not being fixed in our viewing and in our uh, experiencing of space and the relationship between body space and architecture and i think this work does that for me it does i i i feel that it is testing our limits next please anthony can you keep telling us which year ah uh, this is uh maybe 2000 2000 yes uh yeah maybe Because yeah it, it's mm -hmm. nice to see the evolution of your work as it goes on so if you have an idea of which year each work is then i think i i would need to say perspective i might have to look it up in in the universal encyclopedia that is our mobile phones but maybe i won't because that's not a as and when you when you remember you can put it in yeah okay thank you priya we have time but not so much time so yes oh this is an amazing, yeah, so amazing work yes it's it's interesting you know i mean i i think that you shouldn't really have invited me to talk because i can talk because i've been trained to talk but i don't trust i don't trust talking i mean i i would rather just uh, return to the world of my work which is silent and uh, communicates in a different way and I, i i i think there's part of me that is betraying the work by in a way giving all of this pseudo intellectual kind of apologia um i mean it's i think there is a legitimacy to asking actually what were the steps that led from one thing to another and i think that every work in a sense is the mother of the of the next mm -hmm. but um i i say that as a precursor of commenting on this asian field um the the need that i have and i think it's a very deep need to just touch the earth literally and that's what this is so this is 120 tons of of clay uh that has been as it were dug out of the ground and touched by by human hands mm -hmm. and formed into some kind of well expression of the space between two hands and then sort of made conscious by being given eyes um but it is about a reconciliation with the earth and maybe this this idea of how the space of sculpture or the desire to form that i think is specific to our species uh can uh in a way be shared so the, the the you know this is the participation that i'm asking for all from all viewers in terms of the co-generation of value or meaning in this case uh came about as a result of a invitation to actually make so this was made in huadu uh in shanshan village huadu in 2001 um uh it's the asian field i've made a, uh, i i still have to make the african field but but i've made a field for every continent and the idea is very simple to take hello earth for our feet to uh, to to a a a co collection so this is Oh, 
yeah, what, what, how many? It's a, it's a lot. It's 130,000 uh, little sculptures uh, shown here in an old steel mill in Shanghai um, as part of the first uh, kind of, uh, yeah, it was an exhibition that traveled to four cities in, in, uh, in, in China. This is a work which um, I think the only work where the gaze is very important. That's yeah, true. And, and, it, and I think it's very important that the gaze is, the, you know, is actually about absence. It's about these two holes that are just dark, dark holes in the, in the, in, in the rudimentary kind of head of these uh, works that could, you know, the, yes, they could be, they, they could be people, but they could just as easily be any kind of life form, but it has this capability of vision. And I think for me, this was about, uh, it, this goes back to the, to the enclosure of room. Here, mm -hmm. here is the space of art that is a real space, but nevertheless, you're not invited to cross the threshold. It's a physical and enormous space, and in this case, the space of massive industrial transformation, now made into an imaginative space that you, that you just have to occupy. But the extraordinary thing is the turning of the tables. Here, the art is looking at the viewer. You have unwittingly walked onto a stage where you are the, are the focus of, uh, yeah, 200, no, 400, uh, 440,000 uh, eyes. And uh, um, it's a very strange feeling what that feeling is, because the, uh, for me, this evokes, in a way, time just as much as the flat tree did. This is a kind of evocation of the relation between mind and matter as, in a way, the spirit of the ancestors, the spirit of the unborn. Uh, th this is the revealed, as it were, uh, flesh of the earth looking at us and saying, what are you? You that possess what we lack. You that possess freedom, the expression of will, feeling, thought. What are you doing to make our possibility real? And... Uh, you know, I think that at the background of, of many of these works, I, I grew up in a time when this was the Cold War, a time when the most likely termination of the human project was going to be nuclear Armageddon. Now this has transformed into something even more totalized in the time of the Anthropocene. We know that actually, you know, Everything that has happened since the brilliant enlightenment has in fact uh, destroyed nature, the very thing that gives us life, our embeddedness in the biosphere. So the, 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 this, is, um, this is another very political work, you could say. This, this deals with migration, deals with population explosion, deals with, in a way, you know, I was so moved today to see, you know, in the center page of The Guardian, the, the, the Punjab kind of farmers protest. I mean, so moving. The wives of farmers holding the pictures of their dead husbands uh, to be witnessed. Uh, I feel this is, this is part of that same demonstration. It also takes me back to um, prehistoric and Neolithic times. I'm remembering the Sumerian votive figures. They were small and they were clay figurines. And uh, they looked at, they, they, they seem to be waiting, you know, waiting for some kind of a, yeah. uh, divine blessing, you know. So these votive figurines with uh, whole, uh, whole the eyes as, you know, deep set, uh, just looking and waiting for uh, some healing perhaps, you know. And so it just goes back in time. It can just go back to, as you said, to the ancestors or to prehistoric times also, the desire to, uh, be together and to be uh, to be uh, waiting to be seen or to be healed, so to say. It's a it's it's really interesting how we have right from very early times, certainly the Paleolithic, yeah. had to had to remake ourselves uh, 
often in very small form, uh, in order to to understand something about our uh, yeah position between between kind of uh, yeah earth and sky, uh, life and death, and. Uh, you know, I don't believe, Rubina, in, in progress in art. I don't actually believe in progress generally. We, we still have the same brains as we had uh, yeah. 150,000 years ago. I think that, that art, art and its connection to, to survival uh, and to balance and to harmony between, between uh, yeah, uh, all, all living beings is still you know, it's still there. That's that's one of its central central functions. And we live with the same fears, and we want to overcome it. And this is something also that comes through in your work. Let's, I think, let, when we get to blind light, maybe next, please. <laughs> <laughs> next, please, Priya. Priya's gone to sleep. No, no. Priya's, Priya. gone, for a, Priya's gone for a nice cup of hot chai. Um, <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, this is just to show you. This is just to show you how how uh, yeah, Asian field was made. So it was such fun. I can't tell you, and we were so lucky. So we had 350, 60 makers, uh, all ages. So um, you could come as a child if you brought your granny, uh, and uh, you know your your parents could come. So we had that was very important. Then everybody had their own little garden. So it was one meter wide, three meters deep. Then we had, mm. we had 150 servers with the 360 makers. So they would come and bring you. So you didn't have to move uh, mm. from your place. And uh, they would bring you. Show, show another slide because I think uh, this gives you a, this. We made it not only on these basketball courts, but also in other places. Another slide. Um, uh, mm. Uh, you can see here's a server coming, uh, rushing to, to somebody that's run out of play. It was just wonderful. So you would sit, you, you would always have to sit next to somebody you didn't know. And, uh, and you'd sort of, uh, yeah, and, uh, it was February, so it shouldn't have been particularly hot, but it got very hot. So I had to buy hundreds of hats for everybody. So everybody had the same hat, even if they didn't speak the same language. And, um, and, it was just really, really fun and lovely. And uh, it was, was just this thing of reinforcing. People would come to me and say, is this what you want? He said, I'm not, it's not about what I want. It's what, what will come out of your hands. What will come out of that space between your hands? You know, just allow the clay and your body through the repeated action of forming to find your form that is particular to you. And it was so magic because people would go, next slide, maybe there's another slide, of, or maybe there isn't. Um, people would go and look at each other's work and, and, and realize the evolution that each of these people, that, that all of them said, oh, I've never made sculpture, I da, da, da. I said, look, you, 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 you know, you, you, you've, made, you've made your bed, you can make sculpture. Uh, you know, the, the, that they, they arrived at, 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 at finding their form and, and getting extraordinary uh, joy and confidence, not just from what they'd done, but from their friends and their family, seeing them in their work. It was so magical, I have to say. Anyway, one, of, yeah. one of the questions that is uh, coming on the um, on the chat is uh, about your scouting of your locations. How do you scout your locations? Do you choose them? Do you identify them? Do you visit those sites, get to them, and that's how you reach them with your sculpture uh, with your sculptures? Yeah, I. Uh... I mean, sometimes they come to me. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, for example, I mean, the, the, the cook's oven thing, what they said was they knew about uh, the field projects and they said, hey, take the old immigration halls. You know, we have these fantastic mm. long halls where people queued up to, to take the transatlantic uh, Hapagloid uh, line. Mm. And I went there and I, I went there and they were 
so redolent. I didn't want, you could see where people were separated from their luggage, were made into, you know, they had the letters of all of the alphabet uh, where people were kind of processed. And then all the pictures of all the towns of Northern Germany on the, and I just said, I don't want to touch this. This is far, this is far too rich. Um, mm. Let me go look. So then I went looking and, and I, 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 I heard about the Wattenmeer, which is a tide plane of seven kilometers. But so sometimes you're offered something that immediately works like the, yeah, like, like the Remise in Vienna. Mm. Uh, but sometimes you have to say, no, I'll come and I'll sniff around. So that thing, yeah, dousing, dousing, getting to get a feeling. You have to do a bit of research. You have to learn a bit of history. You have to talk to people uh, on the street, in the pubs, in the shops, uh, wherever. You have to get a feeling uh, and then, uh, yeah. Are, are you at that time thinking about the receptivity of the work at all or how the viewers will experience it or that is something that you just leave it open I don't know. Or I think a, a good work? work. Uh, yeah, good works, I think, evolve, um, evolve their, their potential. And uh, I think that once I'd seen the button, yeah, I mean, it was, it was interesting. I think I learned by watching how that... The Wattenmeer was incredible because of this seven, seven kilometer tide plain. It's mm. a very, very, uh, uh, yeah, muddy soil. Yeah. And you have to take your shoes off and you have to walk very slowly because it's quite slippy. And it was really beautiful. I learned a lot in terms of the distribution of work. So they're between 70 and 250 meters apart. Yeah. I learned this, this interval you could say, from just watching how people were walking slowly, being very aware. I mean, almost like walking meditation, being mm -hmm. aware of their uh, feet in relation to this mud. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I don't think there's any one formula. I think that, that this, the, the potential of sculpture to transform in a way the the given into something with, yeah, some kind of numinous power or anyway, some potential. In other words, the place-making possibility of sculpture, I think is enormous. And, and we, all we have to do is, is, is listen to our, our Neolithic ancestors to realize how powerfully they understood it, you know, the, the, the the writing of a, of a natural stone, you know, the standing stone, the marking of space, um, the, the indicator of a time, you know, these primal gestures of sculptural potential in terms of placemaking. I mean, we have so many examples and you, you, have, you know, Ashoka understood it, you know, when you raise an iron pillar, that's all, the pillar doesn't need to have masses of, uh, yeah, decorative or, or figurative uh, potential. It just, it is a marking of a time and a space and the beginning of a placemaking. Am I correct in uh, answering that the, uh, the figures that are in, uh, in the tide and also in, in, a, in, in another time and the earlier work, uh, learning to think are your height, six feet? Yeah, no, they're all my body. Yeah, so they're... they're, they're... Um, not your exactly. weight, certainly not your weight. Yeah, no, no, not, not my weight. <laughs> if I weighed 630 kilos, <laughs> I might not fit in this room, let alone this chair. Okay, can we move on? Next, please. Priya, next. Rubina, you come on the screen. Uh, yeah, I'm calling... I Okay, uh, here we come. Yes. This is, this is what Rubina, what Rubina oh, I mean, to, to see most. And yes. uh, so this is blind light. It's a um, very simple work in many respects, but it, it, it took, uh, I mean, we were very lucky. We, you know, talking about uh, dousing the place. Uh, this is the Hayward Gallery, which was purpose built in the time of brutalist, the high point of brutalist architecture. So it's a it's a cast building that has its own 
in a way, unique uh, respiratory system. Mm. And we had to get to know that. So I crawled all around the air ducts and air intake to understand. Because this, this, this work utterly depends on uh, the, 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 the ability of, the, of the, yeah, the building to replace air. Uh, when you go through this threshold, which is permanently open, this is uh, about maybe 11 meters by nine and a half meters by three meters 50 high, um, or three meters 25 high. Um, it, it, it has within it um, 2,700 lux of light at about uh, 1,600 Kelvin, mm. uh, and a cloud of water vapor that is made of droplets that are one-tenth of the size of an ordinary cloud water droplet. And they are produced by ultrasonic humidification, mm. uh, which is a new technology in a way for, for, for making mist, but it's become very popular. You know, there's hardly a house in Japan where you don't have a little ultrasonic humidifier. But at the time that I made this, they were quite rare. But anyway, the idea is you cross this permanently open threshold and the temperature immediately drops, about three degrees. And as Tushar said, um, you know, if you held your hand out, basically you're, you're alert, you're awake, you're aware, but you are, you're, you've got your eyes open but you can see nothing but light. And if you hold your hand out in front of you, you can't even see it. However, you're aware of an acoustic environment of wet, peep, wet feet uh, on the floor because this is, a, this is a cloud. It's a precipitating cloud. It's producing about 11, 11 liters of, of, uh, of water uh, a, a day, um, which has to drain. And we were very lucky that, that we could also organize that in this space. Um, but that, the, that's all the technical kind of considerations in terms of what, what I felt I was doing is um, making the collective body, making the uh, universal mind somehow uh, experienceable. So you, were, you, you moved into this space. Mm. People were laughing mainly. I think there's a little film actually, if you want to show yeah. that. Can you say maybe that? Gives, uh, the, the next slide is a, is a film. Um, and you yeah. can see the door, the door is permanently open. Um, it's possible that this may not want to play. No, it's good. And the, the formatting isn't very good, but this gives you a good idea of what happens. I mean, you go into this zone of light. In fact, the film makes it more uh, apparent than is really apparent. There should be sound with this, um, and it's quite funny, the sound. But if, if, if we haven't got it, don't worry. Um, the, the funny, people become apparent to you when you're about maybe nine inches away or, you know, 200... Um, millimeters away and the funny thing is that you know you're you're in this environment and and what you hear most is laughter yeah this is the wet floor so you've got the squelching feet and laughter and people asked they said what did you put in that mist because they were sure that there was some kind of like psychotropic substance but ah now you can hear it was this heightened kind of, yeah, liveliness of, of, uh, of laughter and, and, and kind of strangeness. And then this was the other magic that you became, in a way, an image for people on the outside. Right. Um, but, but good. Not knowing where you're going, <laughs> where the walls are. <laughs> no, not knowing where you're going. It's a bit, it's a bit, um, you lose yourself on purpose, isn't it? Anyway, um, uh, I was, uh, this is again an enclosure, like the field was, but a different kind of enclosure within, with a sense of invisible space. And I thought it would evoke a lot of anxiety and fear, but I'm seeing, uh, I mean, listening to laughter and giggles, you know, I was, 
I was thinking the whole idea of being lost or not being able to see one another. You're just uh, grappling and you know trying to touch something, hold on to something, reach somewhere, and this whole reaching somewhere, you know, this some experience of an unknown, invisible space that you are in. It's an interesting thing. I mean, I don't want to prescribe or in any way diagnose. There is no one behavior. And yes. I think the, the beautiful thing is that I think on another day, you know, this could be very scary. Uh, I mean, you know, the isolation of being on top of a mountain in, in, a, in, a, in, in a, yeah, very dense mist is very scary because you don't know where you are. And, and, and to, in a way, this, this, this bigger dialogue, which is a, in a way to do with frames, the, the mm. nature culture frames. Yeah. So I, I've, I've, I've tried to, to, as it were, reverse the tables quite a lot, bringing, as it were, the most uh, extreme uh, elemental uh, thing within the frame of culture and moving, you could say, the, the, the cultural object to be exposed in, in elemental space. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that the, the way I would put it is whatever you take in uh, will probably be amplified. So if there is fear, you will find fear there. Uh, you may you may take in your fear and find it transformed to to joy or <laughs> or, <laughs> or or a levity, um, and certainly that was that was the wonderful thing. On the whole, was my experience that actually it was a sense of euphoria of being relieved from the burdens of self consciousness. Mm -hmm. I think in a time of digital visibility, where everybody is taking selfies, where we are so reinforced through advertising, through all kinds of, in a way, body reinforcement or undermining, you know, that, that the fashion industry and the cosmetics industry equally force on us. Actually, to be relieved of appearance. Yeah. In the end, where do we all live? Mm -hmm. We all live on the other side of our appearance. Our appearance belongs to the world. Our appearance belongs to others. We live on the other side of our faces, of our bodies. And to, to, to enter a space where you are relieved from appearance, yeah, uh, issues you into somewhere. I think it could be frightening, but it could also be free, freeing, freeing. I really place. enjoyed what you said about uh, nature and culture. I think, uh, it's not confrontation in your work, it's coexisting and it's co-joining, you know, it's just conjoining, you know, for the experience to heighten. And that's very interesting. You talked about these elemental uh, forces of nature or elements that you bring into this kind of very, very uh, um, urban kind of enclosures or very bare enclosures to experience it firsthand, you know, and be through it. Or when we go to the sea, another kind of experience. And I think that experientiality is very interesting where how nature and culture can coexist and come together in the world. Next, please. I think that, you know, the, oh no, we've had that. I think that the, the you know, the experience of art should be like, you know, going for a wonderful walk in mm. the, or, uh, on the beach or in the, you know, in the hills, uh, or, or diving, diving into the ocean. You know, it should be one that engages your entire psychophysical, uh, you know, complex. Um, yeah, you're moving and then standing still to marvel something. Both the acts are there, you know, still and moving as your, several of your works do have the title. It's like you walk and you move and you experience, but you come and just get, you're standing still when you see something that you want to marvel at. Yeah. So this is, um, this is breathing room, which is in a way relates a bit to uh, 
to blind light, but actually it's, it's more sinister in a sense. I mean, on the one hand, it's a reconciliation of the mandala uh, with three dimensions. So the, the idea of, um, I mean, what it is, is you take a given volume uh, and you, uh, you take 60% uh, of it and you make it into uh, a, uh, yeah, a delineated uh, three-dimensional drawing that is then stretched, in this case, I think in eight, or maybe it's 12, uh, I can't remember. I think this is the one that I made for, for uh, Sao Paulo. So it's one of the smaller ones. Um, it's the, this is the identical volume folded one on top of each other, in each case uh, with axes pulled in uh, different extensions, to, to different extensions. Now, the, the idea is you walk into this space, there's this light, there's this luminous frame, but it is actually material, so it's, it's made of, of uh, aluminium square section and aluminium that's been painted with photoluminescent paint. Um, and you suddenly are, in, in, a, in a way, in this um, perspectival frame but it is perspective that has been used to, in a way, destroy perspective. So that, that, that I'm, I'm very, very aware of, you know, Mantegna's breakthrough was that he found in single point vanishing perspective, a way of framing space itself or a spatial uh, perspective. I mean, a, 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 a spatial illusion. But that illusion depends, as does this image that we're looking at now, on, as it were, a single point, uh, vanishing point, and, and the location of the viewer. And it's very, very important to me that we are free to move about in here. Maybe the next slide will show this same work, uh, yeah, um, when the lights are on. So what happens the way this the the interval that has previously been made in terms of space in terms of in 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 uh, you know, natural selection or or any of the linear works is now made in time and we have now even more light than in blind light so we go up to about uh, 3800 lux um, that comes on for 40 seconds every 10 minutes. And this thing that, that you had come into as a mandala, as this very, uh, yeah, meditative space where everybody's moving very slowly and... trying to negotiate in a way like, like you can hear everyone, ah! they can't believe it. The, the meditative has transformed into the inter interrogative and suddenly you're, you know, you're in a Stasi kind of interrogation zone where you're, you're, you're kind of, you, you look at your flesh and you can see the blue like veins under your skin and, and, and the light is totally blinding you, you, the, I mean, this is a cruel work in many senses because you, you, you've been in, immersed in darkness for, for 10 minutes or whatever, and, and your pupils have enlarged to be able to, to enjoy that. And then suddenly you get crashed by this. And it's, it, it's a physical assault. But the interesting thing is, I, I thought that everybody would kind of just leave uh, after this, uh, you know, in a way, violent attack by light, but actually quite the reverse. People um, kind of ended up kind of lining the walls, sitting, watching. And this is, this is part of this, in a way, long negotiation between, in a way, passive viewer and active viewer. Um, uh, the, the, the idea that, um, you know, viewers become the viewed for other viewers. Yeah. So actually what the experience was, was, was in, in a sense, both time, space, and then condition, uh, this, this changing condition of, uh, 
yeah, in this case, blinding, literally blinding light. And um, this common space, the, the same space, re-articulated in these very different uh, volumetric drawings. We have about 15 minutes to go um, to do our session. So. Should, we, should we invite some questions, Rubina, do you think? Yeah. Uh, we have too many slides. Maybe we can just show some slides and you can talk about passage and you can talk about the Royal Academy exhibit. Mm -hmm. Can we do that? Oh, this is the film, but don't let's worry about it because I think it'll be too long. Go, go to the next one, Priya. Priya? Um, oh. oh, yeah. So, so this is, uh, this is the urban translation of uh, another place. Um, this is called Event Horizon. We, we can go through this, I think. Uh, oh, so keep, keep next one. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm, I'm interested in what happens when you invade. Uh, so this is uh, mm -hmm. Manhattan, central Manhattan. What, what happens when you invade, as it were, the, the kind of in life on the street uh, with other bodies that in a way uh, interrogate, you know, what is this alien naked iron thing doing in my world? And the reflexivity is, is, is fantastic. So what, we had four, four works on the ground, uh, 27 on the skyline. Mm. And uh, the, the, the idea in a way is to use them as an acupuncture of the city in order for you to a reawaken to this constructed landscape. Next slide. Next. Ah. Um, this, this was a really interesting project in terms of this reawakening idea. Mm -hmm. So here is, um, I was invited by the Hermitage. This extraordinary collection really was uh, you know, started by Peter the Great and then continued by Catherine the Great. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, that, that is maybe one of the greatest universal museums. Okay. Hello. ...in the world. And uh, these uh, Greek and Roman uh, antiquaries to arrive in Russia. The one on the left is, is the first Venus that was the first to arrive. When she arrived, uh, no naked uh, women statues uh, had, had, had existed in Russia. And she, she wasn't allowed entry into the city. She had to live in a, in a cave. Um, and she was guarded by, by, by soldiers and people queued to go in and see her. Um, but uh, my idea was I, I went into this very uh, extraordinary... Uh, space that remained untouched since it was conceived in the early 19th century. Mm. And I got rid of, there were 28 works, it was called the Dionysus Room, and I asked to get rid of uh, 20, uh, 21 of them. I brought in four works from other places and uh, then uh, put them on the floor and then raised the floor. The floor has been raised to a common ground that is more or less gets rid of the carved plinth that was underneath these, that, were, that the original sculptor uh, had left as a support for the work. So what does this do? Basically, it, 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 it reactivates the fact that we exist within a very particular bandwidth of scale. And, and that sculpture through the millennia in terms of, you know, engaging with, the, with, with, with life size has interpreted in a number of ways. And all of these are, they, they go, yeah, the, the, the eros that is in the middle of this picture is slightly less than life size, but it is supposed to be eros, the boy child. Um, Venus is a little bit under life size. Um, the, the, Anyway, they're, they're all, the, the Athena is over life-size, the, the Apollo in the front is uh, um, life-size. But what I wanted to do was, again, use these works 
to reinforce the first-hand experience of the viewer, which for the first time would be experiencing, experiencing these works at the same level as their maker. So you were, you were confronted with, yes, these, these marble calcium carbonate uh, kind of evocations of the human body, mm. uh, but on your level. So this thing of ground that has been such an important part of this talk, mm. uh, uh, yeah, here made in a way the, the ground of the work. Uh, I think the next slide you'll see the complementary uh, uh, thing that I did in the in the in the gallery uh, next door, where you go in, the the floor continues at the same level, and I've installed uh, fourteen of my ataxia works. Um, which are the crudest. Now, this is the big transformation in the work, where suddenly the, the, the body begins to take on uh, the orthogonality and the structural principles of the architecture that normally contains the body. So it's like we have eaten our environment. We are the only creature now that lives within these Euclidean uh, in, uh, in, yeah, enclosures. And now I'm, uh, I, I've eaten that enclosure. I've made the outside into the inside. Um, next slide, I think there may be a view of the, oh no. And, and uh, yeah, that, that dialogue continues then into even larger works where I've kind of made a whole body out of a sequence of rooms. Uh, this is a massive body that you can see has fallen and crash through the floor um, uh, and just lies there in a way this is this is my this is me making public my my questioning of the monument of the colossus of uh, Oz Ozymandias of uh, in a way uh, the 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 thing that scale in sculpture can do next slide I think we, we finished with um, uh, oh well yeah this is another is another evocation of the same idea. Um, this is uh, again my 60, so my five times 12 um, of uh, the body now translated into architectural cells, mm. but those cells have been invited to expand, expand in relation to uh, our knowledge now of the exponential expansion of our cosmic spatial context. And uh, you could say this is a really crazy idea, but these are all, again, dark bits of night brought into the visible that have been, uh, it's like me thinking about the Big Bang, thinking about inflation, thinking about, uh, as it were, the, 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 ever expanding nature of our cosmic environment and applying that thought now to our immediate environment. So this is me going back to the, to the claustrophobia of being molded, mm. uh, making a, a, a work out of my condition of being, as it were, contained by a skin, but then saying, hang on a minute, actually, this is not a defining characteristic. The, 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 our relation between limit and limitless is entirely uh, imaginary. Anyway, whether I succeeded or not, I mean, this is this is like, uh, yeah, this is a sort of, isn't it, a, a space age uh, Stonehenge. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And uh, again, this is another extraordinary. This thing was paid for by the Paul Clay Institute, and. Uh, shown uh, in its entirety at the, at, at the uh, Centrum Paul Clay in, in Bonn, the capital of Switzerland. Next, please. Ah, this is one of my favorite ah, yeah. So uh, it's very, very hermetic uh, expansion mm. field. And I realized that, yeah, it, it, it's not very giving. And it, 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 in, a, in a sense, it allows you to wander about um, dumbly in the, in, in the company of these monoliths 
uh, mm. that you can hit and they boom, which is quite nice, but you can't exactly experience the interiority of those works. So mm. this is passage. This is um, 12 meter long, uh, yeah, literally uh, box with one with its lid off and laid on its side mm. that is um, roughly based on my dimensions. But you're, you know, you're invited to enter and it's uh, it's a rather extraordinary thing. So this is, I would say that 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 sculpture has always kind of aspired to the narrative, but here it is the condition of a narrative, and it is the narrative of your walk, the walk that was implied in in natural selection, but now is a space, mm -hmm. and you walk, um, fitting well or badly this this given silhouette, but you are walking into your own shadow, walking away from the light and into darkness. And some people can't make it to the end. Uh, you're invited to go to the end. Uh, some people uh, find it too frightening. But then uh, I wonder if the next slide has the, has the uh, yes. But having, having turned round, you are then uh, returned to the light, to, to the outside, to the world. Um, so in a way, you know, this is another existential work, um, but it, 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 you, you're, 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 the, you're the subject of the work. And I think you could say that's another overall uh, ambition. Whether I succeed is not for me to say, is to allow the viewer really to be the subject of the work, to be, as it were, the, the ground of the work. Um, and uh, this, um, I think this, this, this work is a, is a kind of shared uh, version of what it means to accept the limitation of choice that, that for me was grounded in the full body moldings that I did for, for so many years. You, you, you accept the conditions of, uh, you know, it's almost like a social contract. You, you accept that I am going to go into this compromised position mm. in order maybe to discover something that I couldn't discover were I not to accept this limitation. I'm in a strange way reminded of the Jewish museum uh, in Daniel Libeskin's room, where you, I mean, I never knew architecture can be so disorienting and unsettling and the evocation of fear, but also hope when you go into that room and- With light, yeah. Yes, with that little ray of light that you see on top of it. That that, that is his masterpiece and, and uh, the way that he activates the floor. Just, yeah. just this, uh, the, the loss of the horizontal in that, mm -hmm. in that work was so mm -hmm. powerful in terms of making you suddenly conscious of your own passage in, in spaces. Yes. Very true. Next, please. Very powerful. Uh, we don't need to, well, this is the film of, of the experience of that work, if you want to see it, but it's pretty obvious. I think we can maybe just uh, go to the next slide. Um, yeah, to the Royal Academy. Yeah. So, um, this was a challenge, you know, the, this, this courtyard has been used by, um, you know, Anselm Kiefer to do his towers, Anish to do his balls. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, Ai Weiwei to do his trees. I mean, it, it's a grand standing invitation to something as magnificent as these 18th century buildings with all of their pride in Western culture in the Enlightenment. This is the, the home of the Royal Societies, the Linnaean Society, the Royal Geographic Society, the Royal Antiquaries and the Royal Academy. And uh, I just felt, well, there's a lot of pomp and ceremony here, and uh, we've got, we've already got, uh, uh, yeah, 
a fine rendition of the artist at work on his plinth. Um, how can I use it in a way to engage the body, the mind, and more importantly, the feeling of the viewer in relation not to the, the aggrandizement of the European Enlightenment project, but to their participation in the future. So uh, I, I had had other ideas, but in the end, we just decided to put this small work that's called Still, that is um, actually a, a carving that I made uh, of my six-day-old daughter, Paloma, who is now 33, so that was a long time ago, uh, as, as this work in the, in the courtyard. And, and uh, well, I don't know, I, I, sp I, I speak about it now. You know, many people um, just didn't see it. You know, they came walking through, full of anticipation, going to the big uh, show. Um, uh, but I think enough people did see it to make me feel that this was worthwhile. And, and I think this was, this was me just, um, it was important, this was a female child, it was important that it had been moved, as it were, you know, uh, from the belly of the mother or the breast of the mother to the, to, to the earth, to the ground, to the common ground, to the common exposed public realm of this courtyard. And uh, I think I was vindicated uh, in a way by, by what happened naturally, which would be a circle of people would stand often in the rain looking down at this vulnerable image of human fragility. And uh, um, somebody's trying to ring me, but anyway, we'll let that go. Um, and uh, I... And I, I realized that actually the visitors, the visitors were somehow, you know, um, they were taking the place of sculpture. They were the, the convening of this moment of connection. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that vindicated my, my idea, I think. And uh, I, I, I'm glad I did it. <laughs> Can we see some more images of this? Uh, yeah. Maybe there's a maybe there's one of the yeah. There it is. I mean, it's very it's uh, it's commonly known as the Iron Baby. It's just again a very it's just a massive piece of of, of iron. Uh, in the there's something magical, isn't there, about these seed moments of a human life. Um, could say this is very crude. This is sort of uh, it's a, a part of the crudeness is the fact that this is, you know, the, you can see the seams of the molding. That it, there's nothing. It, it's a very um, this is industrial prowess uh, and industrial technique being being applied to this most tender and vulnerable time of a human uh, life uh, story. Next, please. Oh. Yeah, so the, now we've got the, <laughs> the internalization. This, this, this is sort of, uh, it works, I think, um, in terms of the sequence of the images that we've shown with you with, uh, yeah, withdrawn the works in the corner and uh, with uh, another another place. Mm -hmm. So this is a work called Lost Horizon, and 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 for me again, this this reinforces this idea of the in a in a, in a sense the uh, the the delusion of stability and. Mm -hmm. I think tries to internalize the sense that yes, we live on a sphere. We 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 have tried to impose the 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 idea of horizontality and verticality onto it, uh, but actually, um, you know, people stand like this on all sides. If we if we apply if we if we square if we square the sphere of our planet, um, there are examples of these life forms in this position. Uh, in 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 this relative uh, uh, arrangement, um, but obviously, yeah, 
sort of physically the experience of coming into a room where you know the the normal certainties about which way is up have been somewhat uh, made uncertain uh, is a physical experience maybe something of what Tushar was talking about this this notion of disorientation but also in a way the collapse the collapse of of um, in a way uh, the the certainties of dialectics between mass and space. Um, and it acts on your body, I think, uh, physically. Uh, I was very, I was, I was pleased with the way this worked. I mean, you could say this whole project, and I think that was one of your questions, Rubina. And it's a, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, it's a very relevant one. Is this not all the most ridiculous act uh, of repeated narcissism, continually, uh, in you know? forcing your body form on an unsuspecting subject. I guess you know, my reply to that is that I think a degree of narcissism has to exist in an artist to make him or her feel that, that, that the work is worth doing. In other words, that, that this example of a singular human experience is worth sharing. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, my, my excuse for this is that I don't want to talk for anybody else. I don't want to, in the manner of my colleague, uh, yeah, Lucien Freud, be um, the manipulator and, uh, and controller of other bodies. Um, I am not interested in the artist model uh, uh, dialectic. I, am, I, I want the truth claim of this work to come from the, the fact that this is a real body in real time that has been, uh, yeah, captured. I mean, these really are industrial fossils. They, that, that's my, and I, I, will, I, I reinforce their industrial origin by, by, by showing the places where the, where the metal came in or, or left the void of the mold. Um, and I, I use them as yeah, acupuncture points in space at large, um, in order to both confront, but then also activate the proprioception of the viewer. And it remains the primordial matter and means to experience the world. Mm. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's so right, Rubina, that our bodies, and it's not just, we live in a visual age where visuality has been commodified, commercialized, and exploited. But, you know, we, we exist within a matrix of perceptual complexity of such extreme, you know, even lifting my hand or, you know, r r raising a pen. You know, the, 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 the subtlety of our autonomic systems, let alone our consciously controlled ones, is so extreme. And to, I, I really want to engage that, the total body sensorium uh, of, of the viewer uh, in the field of the work. Can we move through some slides of this uh, exhibition, Priya? Just seeing them. Yeah, so, so, you know, you could say that these two rooms are complementary. So one has, uh, has uh, as it were, uh, surrogate bodies in it that have been made massive. This has the skeleton of architecture uh, within it. The, this is the revealed core, the reinforcement of, of uh, you know, most, most urban buildings now are, because of economics, are, are made as a... Yeah, a kind of uh, yeah, reinforced concrete shuttered uh, cast buildings. Um, and it was really, for me, I wanted again to activate space itself. So these are 22 uh, room sized volumes that are moving through each other, very similar to the way that they move in breathing room, but now made as a, as a kind of cloud, a kind of mental uh, a, a mental figuration that that hovers in the space. Um, that was a that this is a film, and it's quite interesting to then go on from this 
to the room next to it. Let's let's see this film because th th this this was in a way the most r radical piece. The next film that, that, that this film will show that is called Coordinate, and it's simply three lines that run through uh, five of the galleries. Uh, mm -hmm. linking them, but also in some way activating them. They're like very highly taught uh, tuning, um, well, I mean, like the strings of a violin. Mm -hmm. Maybe that isn't working so well. Um, at the end of can that film. Can you see film. the film? Yeah. No, I can't see the film. Can you see the film? Uh, no, we can't see it at the moment. Priya? No. Uh, yeah, I, I can't. It started. Okay. Uh, you can ask what he wants uh, and just send it to me as a... Ah, yeah, that's right. That's good. Ah, yeah, this is good because you'll get an idea of, of how people in interact um, with this work. But you can see now how there is one line that goes through three galleries and, and here it is. And... I mean, this is a, maybe the most extreme. I mean, what are you supposed to do? I mean, people come into this room. What am I supposed to do with this? I've never seen such an empty room, and it's just got these three bloody wires through it. You know, what am I supposed to do? For me, uh, this, well, this was the room that tested the notion of whether reflexivity was possible. How, how do you feel the interconnectivity or non-connectivity of these Cartesian coordinates that have been, as it were, materialized. Mm. Anyway, what was amazing, you know, this, this is, you know, if you think of Piero della Francesca's kind of ideal city picture, this is suddenly perspective entirely removed from the notion of representation. And, and made into a thing in itself, a literally uh, interconnected spatial activator, mean, and catalyst for experience. Anyway, th this for me, uh, this is as radical as blind light. In many ways, it's tougher. These are like cheese wires through our, our space-time experience. Uh, and it confused everybody, but at the same time, I think was the, the thing that I'm most proud of in the show as a whole. Uh, you know, it was difficult to achieve the degree of transformation, you know, for something so simple, uh, to actually get, you know, we had to put two tons of lateral pressure on 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 the on the one of the legs was 35 meters to have it not deflect. We had to put a six and a half meter bracing uh, structure on the outside wall of the north wall of these uh, 18th century galleries. We had to build a scaffolding tower and a bridge um, across the the studios that are the royal uh, the royal academies. Um, graduate studios um, and uh, amazing uh, you know I mean it was a and sorry I'm not making I'm not making an extra apologia because of the amount of effort that went into making it but you know uh, it it uh, yeah for me the fact that we were able to do it and and indeed then watching I mean for I would say yeah very few people uh, got as excited about it <laughs> as, I did, as I did, but uh, I think it was it was the best work uh, in the show. Can we can we see two more images of the two rooms and then stop there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. If, we go, if we just go, we'll go to the end. We'll go to the. Oh yeah, this is this is. Uh, in a way, the opposite of that. So if that was Cartesian, this is yeah. quantic. This is uh, this is my response to Mantegna. In a in a in a quantum world, we we lose the Euclidean, and we recognize that uh, you know we live a, in a world in which actually, if you know the position, if you know the point of something, you don't know its speed. If you know its speed, you don't know where you are. 
so this, this idea that this is a scribble, a huge scribble that invites you to move through the spaces in a very different way. Um, same choreographic principle that was in existence with, with, with blind light uh, and, 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 with, uh, and with breathing room, but now uh, made into this. I mean, it's basically a great big drawing in space. It's 11 kilometers of, of, uh, of uh, aluminium tubing. And uh, it was, at, you know, talk about the materialization of energy. Uh, it was it was just amazing, particularly how the kids reacted in here. They just went completely crazy. In fact, they went so crazy as they destroyed it. On day five of the exhibition, I had to go and re remake it because in, in this internet age, the kids were getting so excited and the, and the parents were so proud of their children doing amazing kind of choreographic <laughs> moves that they decided that these two very proud parents decided to put their children, two of them, age four and six, on this horizontal uh, kind of, uh, and it pulled the whole thing from the ceiling anyway, never mind. Uh, we, we were able to rebuild it. Um, next slide. Oh, the cube, yes. So this is the, the last, so this is me returning to this idea. Is there a, com is there a common condition? that unites, in a way, the space we occupy when we close our eyes and go into that common but subjective space that is the darkness of the body. The space that we build, that we protect the body in, the space of architecture, and space at large, the space of the cosmos, the space of the night uh, sky. Um, and this uh, is my... Yeah, well, which is which is is called cave, uh, and in these decorated, you know, gilded rooms of of uh, high culture, I wanted to return people to the primal experience of of uh, the cave, of of uh, in a way that return into the body of the earth that is so like, mm. uh, I think, our experience of the first experience we have of life is within the body of the mother within this fluid realm of the amniotic fluid of, of uh, pre-birth pre life. Uh, next slide. Um, this is how you had to get in, and I love this. The, 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 re the relationship of, the, in a way, the, the pre-kind of historic or the non-literate societies where to get into the longhouse uh, uh, in in Bordeaux, you 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 duck through a narrow entrance to, as it were, this collective space. So here we have this grand Renaissance uh, door, but in order to get into the work, you have to you have to duck down and go through quite a narrow passage that gets even narrower. Next slide, and then you arrive in this, I, what I would say is a primal space. It takes maybe 15 to 30 seconds for your eyes to adjust, and then you're in this space that completely contradicts the orthogonality and the decorative kind of schema of the, of the, of the space that it's in. Um, it has an acoustic. Um, it's frightening on the one hand because of all these angles, and the, in a way, this is, this, is, this is architecture after the apocalypse. This is architecture after the... the Eramotus after the earthquake, um, and but at the same time returns you to a primal space, and then you escape through this second, uh, which is actually the left hand. So you come in through the right foot, and you leave through the left hand. Uh, next slide. Uh, oh, this is a film. Don't worry about the film. Let's just go on to the next. I'm sorry, we, we, this has taken longer. So this, this uh, is the penultimate slide of this uh, little uh, discourse. Um, and this is, this is really where the show ends. It's called Host. This is, as it were, the untouched uh, um, sister work to, to field. This is uh, 30,000 liters of the Atlantic Ocean mixed with... Uh, um, 25 tons of Buckinghamshire. Um, and uh, at the same level, mean level, 
as, as field. We removed all signs of the 20th and 21st centuries. There was no light, there's no lighting, there was no light. So if you came to the show after sundown, it was completely dark. This is um, for me, this final confrontation with our time, uh, our, in a way, relationship to the basic elements of, of space, of, of, of air, of water, and of earth. Um, and we are invited just to, to witness it. And again, here is this exclusion. You, you, you're, this is a threshold, uh, an existing threshold. Here is, as it were, a reality. These are real elements uh, just brought within the frame of culture. You, 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 you are invited to, to look on it as itself, as the physical thing, but also as an image, as a, as, a, as a, in a way, a space of dreaming, of projection, of uh, possibility. Um, and uh, yeah, for me, this was a very important, in terms of the rite of passage of the entire, so I saw the whole exhibition as a test site a test site for the idea of what an exhibition can be, a test site for the perceptions and projections of the viewer and their proprioception, and a test site uh, of sculpture itself. What are, the, what are the basic kind of, what is the basic lexicon of sculpture? How can, it, how can it act in the world? And I will just end with a final slide, which is um, really where, where, where I am now, uh, which is really returning to the, to the, to the first moments of our, our species story. So we all know about the urn burial, burials or the, or the mm. smoked uh, ancestor um, yeah, mummies of Peru uh, in the Andes um, uh, of, uh, you know, when I grew up, um, I, were, I, I, were, I was taken very regularly to, to, the, to the British Museum and got to know um, Ginger, he was called. He was a Ptolemaic mummy that was never covered in mummy wrappings, but had simply uh, been buried in the sand and his, his, he, he had kind of dried out. So this idea that we start this show with a, you know, a just, just prone, prone postnatal uh, female body, we end, as it were, with a, with a body that is returning to this fetal position in a time between life and death, um, uh, or an image where this material that you've just seen immersed in water is now has passed through fire. This thing that you have seen unmediated, untouched, uh, has now been made into a kit form in a way with these uh, yeah, 18 body parts that uh, the work is called pile and they're not fixed. They're simply just resting on each other. Um, and th this was a sort of final point of meditation in the show as a whole, you know, where have we come from, where are we going, uh, what are we made of, and what is our relationship uh, to uh, material and to time and to space. Beautiful. Ah, amazing, excellent. I'm so moved by this experience. This, just the whole idea of being there after all the other rooms where you see things in excess and then you come to that room where you see um, dispersed elements, you know, the elements that have, uh, body has evaporated, body has dispersed and gone back to the basic five elements and then back here as a pile. Yeah, it's... Um... I mean, in a way, the host, the host room was just um, saying, you know, these are the base materials out of which life and consciousness have come. And we stand here in a way, uh, I mean, we, we now live as urban animals, uh, you know, over over half of our species now lives within the urban grid. So uh, we, we have forgotten in a way, or, or, or it's very easy of us as a, in a way, yeah, a society that is obsessed with ourselves and our own stories and, and uh, to forget 
in, 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 a, in a sense, our origins and our dependency on uh, the planet and, and this, you know, the biosphere, the biosphere represents something like one billionth of the specific gravity of the planet as a whole. It's this incredibly fragile, incredibly kind of, yeah, a vulnerable skin uh, out of which consciousness has come. Uh, and uh, I suppose in a time where we are more and more aware of the crisis that is upon us and aware that the next 30 years is perhaps the most critical. These are the last moments. It is those of us who are alive now who can determine whether our species story will stop uh, soon. Uh, and the urgency on that is so unbelievably critical. Um, how are we going to reach our Paris uh, uh, agreement uh, commitment? We, we, well, there's no way we're going to get to one and a half. We are certain to get to two, and that is already, we are, we are already experiencing at over one, uh, you know, uh, one, one degree of warming, what, what is happening in terms of the un instability of, of our seasons, of, of our forest fires, of our, uh, the souring and, and acidification rising of the ocean and um, I mean I don't, I'm not now going to make a great environmental spiel but the, the this is this is the you know I, I say to all the artists that I meet you know particularly when they're complaining I say hang on to your anxiety this is real and it, it doesn't matter whether we focus whether we focus on these issues, but the but the the, the inherent uh, you know you could say climate injustices that are being enacted at the moment. The fact that there are you know five hundred billion dollars going annually to support the fossil fuel industry across the world. Um, you know these are these are you know, iniquitous tragedies that we are all complicit in. Uh, and we don't have, we don't have any time to waste. Um, there are some questions, but I think we've crossed time. So I will be sending those over to you. Uh, just one question from an artist, Subha Ghosh, which I will read. Our present condition of being locked down in a closed space in isolation due to COVID restrictions, has this affected your thinking of art? Anthony, could you hear me? Well, I think it's it's the. You hear me? Uh, yeah. One 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 side is that I think that kitchen tables across the world have become studios. You know, people are drawing and 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 making things um, in a way that that you know the way that the culture industry has enforced us into a kind of passive consumption of culture. Uh, has been, I think, compromised or anyway challenged by the fact that everybody's doing stuff, which is great. But then the other side of it, I think, for me, is that people have really appreciated uh, work that is, as it were, in the common spaces of our shared world. So, you know, something like the Angel of the North or another, another place there, in, in the time of COVID and lockdown, it's been amazing uh, how appreciated they've been and people have wanted to go and touch the angel and sit on its feet and be out there in all weathers and somehow feel this relation between a humanly made thing and and the element well it's been so enlightening it's been an illuminating conversation i really enjoyed it thank you so much anthony and tushar and kiran Let's have a word from you at the end of this conversation. Okay, let me start. Thank you, Anthony. That was really breathtaking. I know it's virtual, 
and I look forward to the time when we can meet. Um, this this time will pass, but what an extraordinary evening! The power of conversation is truly enlightening. It it gives us the insight into your works that um, we we would find difficult to get uh, without your translating a bit of it for us. We would get part of it, but maybe not all of it. So this has been very, very enlightening for me, at least. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. Mm. I enjoyed seeing the show at the end. I saw it in London last year. And I think it was the highlight of my visit. I no. thought it was just spectacular. And I think uh, seeing it was, again, was, was like, it was like going back to London in normal times. <laughs> and so we, we, I know this will pass sooner or later, but I look forward to the time when we do see more shows and we see actual art and get out of the virtual space. And we I'm see just curious to know yeah. what is the next show, what is the, what is the next show that you plan and how, do you, how are you working towards something? And, uh, so most most of them have been uh, yeah postponed. But I, I'm I'm the next big show. I'm, I think it'll be interesting because it has a lot of early works. Uh, the next show is in Schauburg, out in Stuttgart, uh, okay. in Germany, which will open in 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 May. And uh, uh, I think that with any luck. Then also Asian Field will open uh, in Hong Kong in, in uh, sometime this year. It was going to be May, but it'd probably be the end of the year now. Okay, I look forward to maybe we can, I come to Stuttgart and see the show. Mm. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for making this possible. Honestly, it was a, a pleasure. I hope I didn't go on too long. No, uh, I think it was great, and it I think have been shorter. I think uh, that would have not done justice to your practice or to your work and to your philosophy and your thoughts. I want to thank Alice, Priya, Madhurima, Jijo, all of them who have assisted us on this and have been with us. And thank you for the for the audience to be there and to be. Uh, this is this was a great opportunity, and I think. Uh, it was wonderful, okay. and I hope that we see you in India, and uh, maybe you also... I'd like to thank oh, Tushar and Rubina. I'd like to thank Tushar and Rubina. Thank you, Kiran. Especially Rubina uh, for, for planning this and putting it together, and of course, Tushar for mm. assisting us in every way pos possible in many fields. Thank you, Tushar. Thank you so much. Thank I you. want. To, uh, can I just say thank you, Rubina? I, I'm very aware that I, I that was a very long monologue, and that you are a very, very sensitive and insightful, uh, yeah, participating viewer of, of art. And I'm I'm sorry that we didn't have more opportunity to talk because actually the questions that you sent were so sensitive. Uh, and so responsive. And um, I feel, yeah, very, very touched and honored by the, 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 yeah, the insights that you've shared uh, with me and, and sadly not with uh, as much as we could have. Um, so maybe we'll have another opportunity to- Certainly, talk sure. More, more one to one. one -to -one. Uh, <laughs> yes. uh, because honestly, uh, it, it's been a pleasure, and, and uh, India is very close to my heart. And Kiran, thank you, thank you very much for making this whole thank thing. Thank you, Anthony. And Tusha, thank you for being the bridge that you are. Thank you, thank Bye. you, thank you. Thank, you. thank you very much for this. Bye. 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 Good night. Good night. You can have your meal now. <laughs> <laughs>